and a different way of thinking about the will to power, the idea of the will to power, is not that everything in its deep essence is struggling to exert itself, but rather as a psychological thing about human beings. So this is a sort of more ordinary uh, scientific empirical claim about human beings, about their psychology, about our psychology, namely that um, the idea of a will to power is something that is especially significant and explanatory for human beings. That is, the feeling of expressing our will on the world, the feeling of giving outward expression to ourselves, to impressing ourselves, and feeling our energy be expended on the world is, that feeling, is an important and valuable feeling and explains uh, a lot. It's, a, it's an essential psychological demand that humans have to um, feel themselves making a difference of some kind in the world. Exerting their power on the world. Willing something and seeing it come about, see it be expressed in the world. Okay, so two different views about the idea of the world to power. Okay, and the last point, um, I want to suggest that the psychological claim is more plausible interpretation, just as I want to suggest that the um, idea of the eternal recurrence as a thought experiment, as opposed to a deep cosmological metaphysical claim, is the more plausible interpretation. So I need to say something about what it is that he, I need to offer a hypothesis about what it is that he might be doing in those notebooks when he does suggest that the will to power is a deep metaphysical truth. When he does suggest that the eternal recurrence is a cosmological truth rather than a um, thought experiment. Okay, and here's the idea, here's the thought. Um, I said last time that Nietzsche came to see um, so, for a, so, so going back to human all too human, um, he came to, he rejected deep metaphysical truths. He wanted to remain uh, on the level of uh, empirical truths, normal scientific truths. Um, but then I said that later he came to see belief in deep metaphysical truths as a projection of the values that we hold. So that's why philosophers make up uh, metaphysical theories as expressions of, as vindications of the values that they hold. So that metaphysics is an expression of one's values. And a plausible hypothesis, I think, is that in these notebooks, when he's presenting the eternal recurrence and the will to power as metaphysical theories, he's illustrating exactly that point. So these fragments, which he chose not to publish, ripped out of context very well might be his illustration of the metaphysics that would correspond to his values. So to illustrate how his values would be projected into a metaphysics, well, that's what you get. You get eternal recurrence as a metaphysical, as a cosmological view. You get uh, the sort of ultimate nature of the world as being an expression of the world power. Um, so, so 
that's a, I think, a plausible hypothesis about what's going on there. Um, and I think the important, and so we'll talk about the will of power, but the important general lesson here is um, Nietzsche is a careful writer, and context for what he's talking about really matters a lot. Um, okay, so on to the genealogy. Um, let me see if there are any questions. You know, it's a long introduction, but he's um, complicated. Okay, so the gene genealogy of morality, 1887. Um, um, I guess I'll start by making two related points about the title. Um, the, well, Kaufman, his first uh, translate, I think it wasn't the first translation, his influential translation of the genealogy um, was titled The Genealogy of Morals, plural. Uh, and that might be a more familiar um, title, but it's inaccurate. Uh, the German is Sur Genealogy der Morals, singular. Um, and this matters because it's sometimes thought that these three essays that compose the book give us three different moralities or three different value systems. Um, but I don't think that's right. I think that what we get are three different aspects of one system of values. Which system of values is that? The moral system of values. Three different aspects or perspectives on morality. Um, a more, a uh, still more literal translation would be something like to or toward uh, a genealogy of morality. And the essays are contributions in that spirit. Um, okay, so what is a genealogy? Um, well, what's a genealogy? What is a genealogy? Anybody ever hear that word before? Yeah. Like heritage. Exactly. What kind of heritage? Family trees. What? Family trees. Exactly. Right. So genealogy, in its literal use, is the story of what, like kinship relations or family relations family uh, descent over time. Um, right, so the study of relationships over time, kind of history of you and your family. Um, in this context, it's the history of a cultural or social phenomenon. So this is the history of a certain kind of idea or ideology and a certain kind of practice, namely, it's a history of the moral value system, history of the system of moral values. So it's not any different from, um, it's not a different kind of historical methodology. Nietzsche thinks it's just good history, um, tracing out all of the connections and changes and influences of the ideas and practices and the tensions and contradictions within them. So as he says um, in section seven, he says he's presenting, quote, a real history of morality. Um, and it's only, he's only interested in, quote, that which can be documented, which can actually be confirmed, and has actually existed. Okay, so the key idea here is that, um, the meaning of the idea or practice changes over time. Um, this is going to, well, we'll see this in all three essays, that this practice that he's, this practice and idea, system of values that he's talking about, is something that develops and changes over time. So the current meaning 
or purpose of an idea or practice is, is going to be often very different from the meaning or uh, purpose that it had when it was first being developed, when it first emerged and as it changed over time. So the task is to trace this history, trace these changes, and see how these different threads come together more or less coherently to form the system of values that we now have. And I want to say again that this idea of having a history of morality, that is a history of the ideas, a history of the meaning and practice, is itself significant. Because we need to, know, we need to be thinking of, um, you need to be aware of this because just that very idea that morality has a history, that it's something that changes over time, this shows what might not be obvious and Nietzsche thinks is a very important first lesson, namely that morality is a historical human creation. It's something that is not inevitable it's something that's not pure or permanent or otherworldly or given in its pristine form by God. It's a human creation and it has a history and we need to identify its causes and influences within human history, especially within human psychology. So morality is not, and I use the term very, very precisely here, already, it's not pure. It's something that has a, is a human creation and needs to be studied as such. So I have to say it's an independent concept for us. Or it's not, it's not an independent concept. Independent, what do you mean independent? Like there is no, like he's saying, Morality, it, it's, like, it's like mathematics or arithmetic, like whether we acknowledge it or not, arithmetic is still like one plus one is two. But morality isn't one of those kind of a priori independent things that we just know. It's yeah, I'm not sure it. what he would say about mathematics, but yes, so yeah, point is right. Great. That this is a social practice. There have, I, I didn't say this, but I will, there have been other social practices that have been rivals to the moral system of values. That is, there have been other systems of value besides the moral system of values. Recognizing that is an important step itself. Um, and so, and furthermore, as you just said, uh, the meaning, significance, in fact, I think Nietzsche would say the value of this system of value also is something that changes over time. In other words, uh, just to anticipate for a second, it may be the case that at one time in human history, embracing the moral system of values really was a beneficial thing to human beings. In another context, in another circumstance, that same or translated system of moral values really may be destructive. Does Nietzsche acknowledge objective morality? Does he acknowledge objective morality? Objective morality. What do you mean by that? I mean that there's truth that apply to everybody in the context of morality? Okay, so there are a couple different questions here. One is whether he thinks that it's possible to make an evaluation of the values that somebody just happens to have? And for sure the answer is yes. So in that sense, the fact that I hold a certain set of values is not the end of the last word on that subject. You or somebody else or Nietzsche can certainly critique that system of values. So he's not a subjectivist in that sense. On the other hand,